our 30 scholarship recipients. We are coming up on our third annual uh, Anchor Awards um, program, where we'll be honoring Rick Sasso, a speaker on this series later on in the month, as well as two other, another stalwart in the industry, Mr. Wynn Thurber, who is the chairman of Norton Lilly International, the largest shipping agency in North America. So it is with a lot of pleasure that I welcome you here today on behalf of our board of directors and supporters. We are hoping really to use this series to sensitize Caribbean students across the region to careers in the all important uh, maritime sector, because as you will hear from our speaker today, uh, virtually shipping affects virtually every aspect of your life. If you're wearing a garment this morning, it likely came in by shipping. If you had your breakfast this morning, it likely came in by shipping. Every aspect of your life is affected uh, by shipping. And the Caribbean has a unique role to play in the industry, which you'll hear for, uh, about a little bit more from our, our presenter, Mr. Rick Sasso. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, who will be speaking on what's in a box. I think this has to be my favorite one. I love boxes. I think of the Christmas box and the Christmas surprise. And the container is exactly that. It is a box holding lots of surprises. So let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Morell. He's the Senior Vice President, Managing Director of Salt Shop and retired Chairman of Tropical Shipping. He was born and raised in Kenya, East Africa. Rick Morell moved to the Bahamas in 1965. He started his career with Tropical in 1969 as, owner, as the owner rep representative, the position leading to since as general manager, traffic manager, head of sales and commercial activity, and ultimately starting in 1987 as president and CEO and chairman of Tropical Shipping. After 31 years at the helm of Tropical, Rick retired in December 2017, immediately stepping into a new Caribbean focused role as SVP managing director with Tropical's parent company, Salchuk. He remains chairman of Tropical Shipping. Actually, he's retired chairman of Tropical Shipping. Under Rick's leadership, Tropical grew to become the leading ocean carry and logistics provider for US and Canadian manufactured exports to the Bahamas and the Caribbean. In his current role, Rick represents Salt Chuck's portfolio of domestic and international shipping, logistics, air cargo, air cargo energy distribution, and marine services companies as they seek to better serve the Caribbean market. But my favorite point about Rick is that he dons this amazing African festival costume. You gotta see it to believe it. Rick, it is my pleasure to have you back here again. You have been such a big supporter of us being one of our Anchor Awards recipients a few years ago and in our family. It is my pleasure to have you. Well, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations to you and to all the team that have basically put this uh, program on together. So what we've got in the world of uh, modern science, we've got people in New York, people in Florida, people in Guyana, people throughout the Caribbean, all together here today. And every one of us are basically dependent on the container industry for what we buy. 90% of everything you buy was moved by a container. So if I could go to slide two, please. Uh, why is this important to you? It's important to you because there's a huge amount of opportunity in the shipping and the maritime transportation world. Things have changed and things are gonna keep changing. Uh, the ship logistics depend on shoreside supply chains where 100% of everything is transported. And the container has brought about massive change that has benefited everybody on this call. The birthplace of this challenge, believe it or not, and this whole change in the shipping industry was born in the Caribbean and benefiting its people. So uh, with that, I just want to continue. This particular slide is a tow ship pulling into Puerto Rico. Uh, and that is one of the ships owned by the Salt Chuck group of companies. So the, the story of container shipping starts with the ingenuity of mankind basically to always be moving and improving to gain efficiency, to lower cost, and to make a competitive advantage to make money. So it's ingenuity and innovation that pays. 
Ships have gone from wind power to coal power to oil power, and now more recently to the two salt chuck companies, tote ships, which were the very first container ships in the entire world powered by LNG. Hmm. Both ships were built and dedicated to serve the Caribbean island of Puerto Rico. Hey, that's another first for the Caribbean. Not only were containers invented going to the Caribbean, but here the first LNG ship in the world, also in the Caribbean. The Caribbean holds a special place in the history of innovation in containerization because the very first intermodal container movement ever in the world started in 1929 between New Jersey, New Orleans, and Havana, Cuba. So how did all this happen and why the Caribbean? Slide three, please. Uh, the history of cargo handling. Cargo was always handled by the case. And then somebody in the world uh, thought that wasn't a good idea. Some of you have may, may have heard the Harabelle Fontaine song, Dale, <laughs> you know, come Mr. Taliman, Taliman. Tali All right, that was typical of long ago time when everything on ships was loaded by the case and bananas by the bunch. Then someone came up with a great idea. Why don't we invent a pallet? And everything changed. Ships were designed to move pallets. Pallets were a much more efficient way of loading ships. So, uh, unfortunately, that was, took a long, long time. For example, a ship that would go into New York to load uh, pallets or the Caribbean, it might take six days to unload and load. So that's a long time for a very expensive piece of equipment to ship to sit around. So 1929, the slide on the left shows them lifting a rail box car onto a ship. And that was the first containerized movement that ever happened in the world. And that was going to Cuba. All right, so why was Cuba elementary at the very beginning in the business? Because there was a lot of cargo moving every week with regularity. So it was very easy to basically put in place a system that would be better than pallets. Why don't you just put the pallets in a boxcar, load the boxcar on the ship, send the ship to Cuba, bring the ship back. And so instead of a ship taking six days in port by loading these boxcars, it was down to 10 hours. 10 hours in uh, New York or New Orleans, 10 hours in Cuba offloading it down there. So that just shows you where, where things really began. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem was a whole lot of rail cars at the time, it takes a ship specifically designed for that uh, and uh, unfortunately, the wheels on these boxes take up a lot of room. So after this thing started in 1929 from New York and New Jersey, and it ran continuously until the 1950s, an imitation service was also launched in the 1930s, again to the Caribbean, it was to the coast of Venezuela. Uh, and another one was also imitating the Royal Bo uh, rail boxcars on ships from the Port of Palm Beach, which is where I am today, from the Port of Palm Beach also to Cuba. So the beginning and the end of the Cuban Railroad is still in place at the Port of Palm Beach. Uh, these were the first services that were ever over the ocean, intermodal, international services in the world. However, there's a big problem with rail boxcars. They take up a lot of room, as I mentioned earlier, and you cannot put many on because they're, they take up so much wasted space with the wheels. There had to be a better way. To be efficient, every inch of space on a ship has got to be used properly. So Malcolm McLean, uh, an American guy, was operating a trucking company and he had trucking and shipping. So he had Pan-Atlantic shipping and he had a new idea. Uh, what if we could take the boxcar without wheels and figure out a way to put it on a ship? He heard about a service going to Alaska where somebody had invented the ability to stack two boxcars, two not real boxcars, but two boxes, one on top of the other. <clears throat> so he designed a ship 
He took a very low price ship from the US government, designed the ship, and he created a 35 foot container with corner castings, strengthened at each corner uh, as for stacking and loading. <clears throat> and basically he ran that ship domestically first from New Jersey to Houston, Houston to New Jersey. Uh, that basically became the first all container shipping service in the, in the world after the intermodal boxcar that went um, down to Cuba, later Venezuela and to Cuba from Florida. At that time in the uh, 1950s, there was a young student at Auburn University in Mobile, Alabama. His name was Ken Johns. Ken went on to become CEO and president of Sealand, which at the time he led the company was the largest container shipping company in the world. Ken and I have been business friends for all my shipping career. And a few weeks ago in preparation for this presentation to you, he related this story to me. On a career day at his university, like many of you will have uh, at some point in the, in the near future, in the 1950s, Malcolm McLean, the guy that started Sealand, had a chat with Ken. And all they did was talk about football for about a half hour. After talking about football for half an hour, he offered him a job when he graduated. The day after graduation, Ken went to Malcolm's office in Mobile, Alabama, and said, hey, you offered me a job, I'm here to collect. Uh, Malcolm sent him out with others to sell and talk up this crazy new idea that Sealand, which became Sealand, of moving containers from New York to Houston. The idea was so radical that most people told him the same story. Come back and see me a year if this thing is still around. Malcolm ran the container service from New Jersey to Houston, a US domestic run, Newark, Houston, in April 26, 1956 is when they started. After great perseverance, it worked and it worked very well. Malcolm had a problem. Where to go next with this crazy system that he come up with called containers? Back to the head of the line comes the Caribbean in international trade. This time it's Puerto Rico. Sealand started the service there in 1958. The first sailing was a disaster. The Puerto Rico Union refused to work the ship and this new technology and they had to turn around and wait a month for the local issue to be resolved. What followed for Sealand was a startup to focus on after they were successful to Puerto Rico to start up to Europe with a focus on Rotterdam. Uh, and when the Atlantic service started, that's when the container age really began in the big time. And it was no longer confined to just the local international waters of the Caribbean. 11 years later, when I just started at Tropical Shipping, a Ned Lloyd Dutch shipping senior executive was on his huge ship in the Nassau Harbor with his agent and he looked with disdain as our small tropical ship with its lousy little 22 containers uh, went by his big ship and he turned to his agent and said there look at that there's no way those containers will ever replace our efficient pallet system that tropical company will be out of business in a year three years later Tropical Shipping worked with Ken Johns at Sealand, and we had taken all of Ned Lloyd's Europe to Bahamas business, and Ned Lloyd was gone from the Bahamas market. Containers had beaten the old pallet system. Next slide, please. The principal benefits of the container began to move into a new area of activity. In my own career, it was changing the way rum moved from case goods manufactured in the Bahamas and Caribbean and shipped to Europe and the USA, moving in bulk uh, tank containers. Late to the game, even most of the world's big movements of, uh, of cargo, refrigerated cargo, such as bananas, are shifting over to container movements. The refrigeration revolution enables cruise vessels, like this one on the slide, to basically stock up with dry and refrigerated cargo and locate the start of their cruise anywhere that they deem they want to start. And that's led to a huge boom of business in the Caribbean, where uh, while before COVID, 
where cruise ships could basically base their operations in the Caribbean. People fly in, spend a few days in hotels, get on a cruise ship, do a cruise, get off the cruise at another Caribbean island or the beginning island, have another few more days or week at a hotel, and then go home. So for 30 years, Tropical Shipping and other shipping companies have made the on-time service to the Caribbean cruise industry an important part of serving this very important piece of infrastructure for Caribbean tourism. The logistical support has enabled home porting of cruise vessels in the Caribbean to become a reality. This has been a big benefit in creating more tourism, more jobs throughout the Caribbean. Next slide, please. So the container transshipment business, everybody's heard about transshipment. The containers given birth to economies of scale where large vessels can drop off cargo to be quickly relayed on lots and lots of smaller vessels like ours uh, throughout the Caribbean. This process has further eroded the economics of break bulk and palletized cargo and the use of sloops in the region. The picture on the, uh, on the right, basically with its, uh, I, I'm sorry, yeah, the pictures with the little yellow dots represent basically all the transshipment points in the Caribbean. Uh, you can't see Panama, but Panama is there as well as is Cristobal. Uh, the other picture represents all the connecting points through and to and within the Caribbean. So transshipment points, the smaller ones are uh, St. Thomas, St. Croix, Barbados, Trinidad, uh, and the larger ones are Cristobal, Jamaica, Calcedo, and Freeport, Bahamas. Uh, what does this mean for the Caribbean consumer? It means that the products you buy uh, cost less than they would be if it came in by palletized cargo. The connectivity is amazing when you lay out all the shipping lanes, as you see in the picture on the right, uh, all these connection points, not just to and from every island, but to and from every part of the world. All possible because the container revolution has made uh, the whole global economy so much more efficient. Uh, next slide, please. What you need to understand about the buying power of the Caribbean is that the Caribbean consumer and business buyers brought about by the growth of tourism, supported by containerization and connectivity for all the shipping products that come in from the United States has resulted in the major growth of trade with the USA. These trade statistics from the US Department of Commerce show that the Bahamas and Caribbean supported by the massive container shipping network that you saw in the previous slide, is now the sixth largest buyer in the world of exports. This is an amazing fact that most people don't understand. The so Caribbean is number six in terms of uh, trading partners for the US exports uh, in the entire world. Next slide, please. Today, why is all this important for you? Today, Caribbean women leadership in the, in the transportation industry is truly amazing. Tropical has 15 strong, competent women in high leadership roles with 10 Caribbean run, women running their respective Caribbean markets. They're the boss. Today, Caribbean female leadership in transportation brings added energy to our industry to think of service innovation, service improvement, and the environment and the future for our children and beyond. Today, the container industry and its place in the logistics supply chain in the Caribbean is the fundamental foundation and the springboard for the region's economic growth and economic prosperity. Today, investors planning Caribbean and Bahamas projects know that goods for export or import or food or parts for hotels or residences can be shipped in on time, damage free, with high dependability. Today, the container has made that possible. Today, we burn cleaner fuels such as clean diesel, and like the two LNG ships, our salt truck company deployed to Puerto Rico, energy is cleaner. Improvements on an ongoing basis to improve our service, to improve our company's competitiveness, and to improve the overall lives of the people of the Caribbean, and in other markets we serve 
is the focus of our company. If my company does not innovate, if our company does not create new ideas and better ways of doing things more efficiently, our company will die. Next slide, uh, sorry. Uh, the future is exciting. So uh, while you see here the slide, satellites, I mean, just what we're doing today is an example of what has transpired. So the future, as fast as things have changed over the last 30 years, I can assure you the pace of change is accelerating. That's good for everybody on this call. There is a future that brings automated cargo vessels, automated terminals like the one in London's Gateway uh, terminal operated by TP World. The future brings low cost drone cargo deliveries, dramatic changes in the speed of cargo deliveries. The cargo launch, uh, I'm sorry, the ongoing launch of LEOs, low earth orbiting satellites by the thousands will transform the lives of everybody on this call and everybody we know. Hundreds have been launched by SpaceX. The internet will be available at low cost in the middle of the ocean or the deserts of Africa and even in the frozen Arctic. SpaceX is awaiting its 10th Starlink launch. Uh, it just actually went over last Thursday and it will now have uh, 538 satellites deployed its goal is to reach 1,440 to start commercial service. Friends and family trials are underway and SpaceX looks to begin commercial service in the next uh, couple of months in the northern part of the United States, then expanding across the world thereafter. All cars, all trucks, container ships, and maybe even intelligent containers will be built equipped with flat panel antenna manufactured by a company called Kaimata also in Seattle. Uh, this is a Seattle-based company, like our salt truck company. And again, it's in a company based on innovation and change. All this technology will bring change, challenges, and great opportunity for each of you. All these changes will transform your lives, my life, and the opportunities in ways that we cannot imagine. So give me the next slide, please. This is an example, it's a quick slapshot, a snapshot from marine traffic, which you can check on the, on the website, uh, www.marinetraffic.com. It just shows you how many ships are roaming around the Caribbean region at any one time. Some days there's a lot more than this, but this is just a typical one hour snapshot of what's going on. Uh, the, you know, basically blue is the cruise vessels, uh, green are cargo ships, red are tankers and pink are pleasure boats. For each of you, this shows shipping is a huge and great career opportunity. Slide nine, please. Uh, because, you know, why is it a great opportunity for the future? Because 90% of everything that everyone buys is moved on the ocean. Uh, Shoreside logistics represent 100% of everything's moved by land. The future is really yours to enjoy. I wish everybody on the call great success with your future. And remember this, to reach great heights in your careers, it's your attitude that determines your altitude. Make every day count for others and for you. Thank you, and I'm open to any questions that, that you would like me to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick, for that really, really exciting uh, presentation. I had read and knew that the Caribbean played a pivotal role in containerization. I didn't realize how deeply that went. And thank you also for adding uh, additional information about the attitude really for uh, that uh, young people should bring to the table in order to be successful. I'm reminded also of that other phrase, a rising tide raises all ships or something like that. So certainly with the amount of shipping and vessels in the Caribbean Sea, this presents tremendous opportunity for everyone. So I'll open now to the uh, Q&A, but before I do that, I wanted to remind our students of the survey which you'll find in your chat box. Please be sure to complete them. Also, we are offering a full tuition scholarship for a student attending these uh, sessions. Uh, the uh, application to the link, I believe, is also in your chat box. Remember to do that. And I would also like to remind you that you must register for every session. Don't assume 
that because you registered for this session or the past session that you will be automatically included. Please, you must register for every session. So now it is my pleasure to ask Mr. Pierre Cook, Prime Minister Barbados National Youth Parliament to manage the Q&A. Is Mr. Cook available? Yes. Good morning. I was trying to start the video there. Um, thank you, Mr. Merle, for your contribution, and thank you for just bringing into perspective these conversations about, um, you know, shipment in the area, the Caribbean, and also talking about the container industry. Um, it's very important for young persons to understand this space and understand how we can get engaged um, in this type of conversation. And thank you again for providing that perspective for us. So we have quite a bit of um, questions. Uh, the first question is, um, have containers reduced the cost of shipping and has the Caribbean continued to innovate or contribute to innovation in shipping? Um, have containers reduced the cost of shipping and has the Caribbean continued to innovate or contribute to innovation in shipping? Yes, so in answer to the first question of reducing cost, a ship basically costs something in the order of anywhere from 10000 to as much as maybe $20,000 a day to operate. So if a ship sits in port unloading pallets for three, four, five, six days, multiply that by the cost of $20,000 a day or $10,000 a day, whatever the, what, depending on the size of the ship. Uh, and when a ship goes in with containers and it's in and out in six hours, and it goes on to another, that you need a lot less ships to operate a container business then you do a break bulk shipping business. And that was the reason why operating closely with Sealand Tropical Shipping in my time, we were able to put uh, the Royal Devlin and the Steamship Company, now known as KNSM or Ned Lloyd, uh, we were able to put them out of business in the Bahamas because they have to have so many ships. And we just had, we were working with Sealand. We could come in, unload very quickly and be done and gone. Uh, cargo was coming from Europe every week, on time, all the time. The pallet ships were just, you know, it took forever to unload when they got to Nassau. They had a lot of damage. People had to build damage of goods into their costing infrastructure. With a container, it was completely different. No damage, quick receipt of cargo. We were able to reduce people's inventory in their warehouses by millions of dollars. So if you take a beer importer out of uh, Holland, combined with Sealand over, say, Jacksonville, rail to Tropical, Tropical over to Nassau, Bahamas, with a three times a week service, we were able to reduce that beer importer's inventory of Heineken beer from what was about uh, eight weeks of inventory to two weeks of inventory. So we freed up probably a million dollars of capital that he had tied up in his, in his thing. That's how we reduce prices. In terms of the innovation, the innovation basically came about in the Caribbean uh, through Malcolm McLean uh, and the rail box car that I mentioned. Uh, basically, Cuba could accept the rail cars on their grade rail that they had, and that just worked up beautifully from 1929 to the mid 1950s. But the moment the container started, it took over the box car right away. So, and again, what happened? It reduced the price. It improved the frequency of service. It was much faster than having to then unload the pallets from a boxcar and truck them to a facility in Cuba. Uh, the, the, the container would go directly to the facility in Cuba uh, and directly to the facility in Puerto Rico. So that's the reason the containers won. Indeed, the entire um, gross national product of the world could never have got to where it is today without the container. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I think when we speak about, we have those conversations about, you know, kind of development and innovation, it speaks directly to the engagement of young persons who come on with these innovative and bright ideas. Um, and just listening to the story of Malcolm, it kind of sparked um, that conversation about how can young persons get involved and engaged in this space, um, which is why the work of the American Caribbean Maritime Foundation is important in providing that scholarship opportunities for young persons to develop within this space. Um, our next question speaks to the Panama Canal, and we know there was a development project in 2016. 
Um, so this question basically asks, how important is the Panama Canal to the Caribbean and the transshipment industry? So I would say it's pivotal. Um, it really is because if you if you don't bring goods from uh, from the Far East to the Caribbean, which it imports a lot of cargo from the from the Far East, if you don't bring it through the Panama Canal, you've only got two ways to get to the Caribbean. You could go through the Suez Canal. You could go a long route by way of South Africa up to Europe and then maybe over or direct around South Africa. Um, or you go around the tip of South America. So the Panama Canal, by its widening of the project, basically that widening enables ships to go from uh, four to 6,000 TEUs to 12,000 TEUs. Wow. In 20 foot a TEU is a 20 foot equivalent unit. So a 20 foot container they could take before the widening of the Panama Canal, that canal could only take ships of 4,000 to 6,000 20 foot containers. Today it can take up to 12,000 20 foot containers at a time on a ship. So again, the cost per unit shipped into the Caribbean is very important. Jamaica has become a very important hub uh, with cargo coming through the Caribbean and then being distributed. So has uh, Freeport in the Bahamas and, and has Cristobal in, in, uh, in Colombia. So Colon on the, uh, on the east coast of Panama is really the transshipment point through which that moves. So logistically, it's a very important piece for the Caribbean to be able to receive cargo at nominal pricing and a lot more efficient than pallets in the old system. So uh, Panama Canal is really, really important. If it were ever shut down, the answer, the, the, the alternative is the Suez Canal or coming around the Horn of Africa, both of which are expensive. Thank you. And I think that that paints a very clear picture to me and I guess for the other persons on the call about why in this space innovation is important and why when you have conversations about developing this industry, um, we have to look at logistically how can we get involved, what are the areas that we need to have developed, and then how can we encourage you know young persons to get into the space and provide these great ideas for this conversation about development. Um, and in looking at that space and in looking at young persons getting their foot in the door of this industry, um, what are some of the logistical type business opportunities for entrepreneurs in the Caribbean? Um, young entrepreneurs who want to get in or look at the blue economy, look at this um, container shipment business, what are the opportunities for us to get in in terms of being an entrepreneur in that space? Well, I think if you look at uh, how do I order something today and have it tomorrow, and then if you look at, if I can order it today and get it tomorrow, why can't I order it today and get it today? Mm. And the bright young minds that are currently working at Amazon, you know, in the United States and around the world, that's what those guys are trying to figure out. I put an order into Amazon on Friday and it was here at my door on Saturday morning at 9.30. And that blew my mind to be honest with you because mm. I didn't think it would come on Saturday. I was expecting it on Monday. But I think for the Caribbean, you know, you're still ordering stuff today and getting it next week. And the thing I'm working on and the thing I, you know, the opportunities that all of you should be working on is how do we order it today and get it today? How do we order it today and get it tomorrow? There's lots of innovation in there. I mentioned about the satellites that Google, uh, you know, both Google, SpaceX and Tesla are all putting up and rushing to become the first in the world with total connectivity, no matter where you are and on this planet. Those opportunities that young minds, certainly a lot brighter than mine, will be able to figure out new innovative ideas, just like Malcolm did with a container that was really, you know, by everybody that was in the shipping business. And I remember meeting these people. They just thought it was the dumbest idea in the world. <laughs> this container was the most stupid thing because you have to move it empty back to where it started. It was the most crazy idea in the world. It would just never work. Well, guess what? It worked, it worked extremely <laughs> well. Uh, and so I think the innovation is there. The innovation is even in the mechanisms of transport from the dock to a place of business, the customs innovation. How do we make all the processing of paperwork so much faster, so much easier, and so much more efficient for the governments to collect money quickly 
-hmm. so that things are not sitting on the dock for a week and government not getting their money for a week. How do we make all that so much more efficient, so much cleaner, and so much quicker for the governments to get their revenue? So everywhere you look right now, there's opportunity for innovation. Working, how to work the cargo in the ports. You know, in many ports in our region, we're still working cargo in the ports the way they were worked 20 years ago. I include some of our own operations in that. So there's opportunity everywhere. I mean, no matter where you turn, there's opportunity for young minds to come in and create and make a difference. Thank you, Rick. Um, very, very important. I think within my space, you know, being prime minister of our youth parliament, the thing is, is that you find these forums and these conversations where you realize that the opportunities are there for young people to be engaged. Um, the opportunities are there for us to get these jobs and look into how we can provide the um, our services for the development of this industry, which is important to not only Barbados, but the Caribbean and the region. Um, when we look at that list of the contribution of the Caribbean to the US um, shipment industry, we see that it's incredible. Um, so this conversation about how youth can get involved, how we can become more innovative. I noticed that, that you said, you know, if, if your company did not innovate, it would die. Um, and that speaks to if you don't engage young persons, if you, you don't engage these bright minds, then necessarily that innovation would not be there for a sustainable um, industry. Um, so the next question speaks to that idea around technology, the development and understanding everything that happens within that space. Um, so there was a mention of an intelligent container. Could you explain what that is to us? Yeah, basically right now, uh, if you want to know where your container is, and what's going on inside that container. You know, most people, you've got to make a phone call. In some cases, you can dial up and, you know, go into the company's website and find out where it's at. Um, you know, but an intelligent container would probably contain, in my mind, it would contain all the information about the contents that's in the container. It would contain any information about any damage that had happened or anything that was untoward if the door had been opened, for example, um, when it shouldn't have been, um, you know, by somebody other than the person receiving the goods at the other end, as happens with Scotch whiskey and other things like that. So an intelligent container would basically have the capability to know all that. It would be uh, this company called Chimeta. I went to see them, read about them about four years ago, decided to go in and, and take a look at their facility where they're developing this radical new technology. Right now, you see on ships and, uh, you know, pleasure boats, they have these huge domes uh, that basically contain a, a geo-operated geo, um, uh, antenna that will seek and find a satellite in order to be able to communicate. Well, Cometa have invented basically, think of it as a TV screen, uh, a TV panel that would be flat, that would go between the headliner of your car, the headliner of the container, and the headliner of a truck, and it will be in constant communication with all the intelligent data that's in that container, wherever that container goes. And as things change, the intelligent data would be changed as well. My goodness, wow. Well, so, you know, I mean, the radical change that will come about, it could then do, it could even intelligently do the duty entry for the goods for whatever port it's going to. I mean, think of all the opportunity and all the change that's coming. You know, guys and gals, let me tell you, these flat antenna are operating. Uh, Tropical was basically the first ship to put it as a beta test site on our ships uh, four years ago. And they're, they're moving on with the development of this technology. You marry that up with the low earth orbiting satellites that I spoke about and SpaceX launched another 58 of those last week. You know, there's going to be a sea change that is huge, not just for the governments of the region, the ability to basically collect money faster, but also for the shipping companies and agents and ports to know much better. So for example, if somebody picks a container up in a port, puts it on a truck and it's the wrong truck and it's the wrong container, uh, wrong truck going to the wrong place, the intelligent container could send a warning out right away. So all these things are coming. I mean, and it's not like it's Tomorrowland. The technology is there today. Mm. So it's fascinating, and I'm excited by the future. Oh, wow. Thank you. No, that, that truly is exciting um, to think about it. I mean, 
fascinated by the technology of it all. And sometimes um, as young people, you might think about the shipment industry and think it's a bit archaic. Um, you know, you go to the port, it takes forever for you to get your stuff out. But understanding the technology behind the system, it speaks to a very creative and comprehensive type mechanism for this to work. Um, and, I, and I hear you talking very um, nicely and we understand that your company has been doing this great work in this area and it's been like cutting edge and leading um, the drive for innovation and change. What has it been like in terms of other shipment industries um, in the region or elsewhere? Are they pursuing that same trajectory of development? Are they looking at these innovative ideas as well? Or is this something that you were just trying to develop within your, um, or your company and others will catch on a bit later? What has it been like with other industries? Well, I think you know, if you take Maersk, Maersk basically are following the tropical model where, for example, tropical is a freight forwarder. They prepare ocean shipping documents. They're an insurance company. They'll underwrite cargo. They're a delivery and intermodal operator across rail, air, whatever the mechanism needs to be able to move the cargo. You know, tropical does that. Maersk today is uh, plowing billions into becoming, you know, a um, point to point operator. Uh, providing all the logistics support for moving a particular shipment. So MERSC, CGM, CMA, there's huge investments going on across the world, um, both China Ocean Shipping Company, every shipping company is at the cutting edge because if they don't get there, believe me, they will die. So it, it's everywhere, even in the air cargo business. I mean, you, you look at FedEx, just look at Amazon. I mean, Amazon is not a shipping company. But Amazon today is probably one of the biggest shipping companies in the world. And in three years, with a bunch of young guys out of college, Amazon has gone from, in the United States, from delivering zero of their shipments to customers to delivering, within three years, 48% of everything that they bring to a household in the United States is carried, delivered by Amazon themselves. All across America, you see these Mercedes-Benz trucks with Amazon Prime on doing deliveries. So from zero three years ago wow. to today, 48% of every delivery, they're rapidly becoming as big as FedEx, which we all know about, just because they've been doing all that themselves. So as you know, FedEx does no longer move any Amazon cargo because they saw them as a big threat. Our company also works closely with large business to consumer providers. We have an air cargo division that handles that. Uh, particularly, they go down through the Caribbean, it's called Strat Air. We also operate up to Alaska as well and to Hawaii. So there's innovation everywhere. And within the Caribbean, you've seen innovation in the ports of Jamaica, in the ports of Freeport in the Bahamas, uh, Cristobal in uh, Panama, You've seen changes at the ports in uh, Trinidad, in Barbados, with new investment coming in. Uh, but there's there's huge opportunities still for substantial improvements beyond where we're at today, both in the entry process, the duty process, the pre uh, processing of the paperwork. Uh, all of those are things that are just ripe for continued innovation, going beyond Asakuda and the mechanisms that exist today, going into make it. Uh, very fast and efficient, which, by the way, a lot of that has already happened in the Bahamas. And kudos to the Bahamas Customs, working very closely with the shipping lines and air cargo companies to accomplish some radical change uh, to make all that possible. So there's huge opportunity everywhere. It's really, really exciting. Wow. Thanks, Rick. Um, and even seeing, you mentioned the Bahamas and the innovation that they're doing there at their port. Um, and I mean, part of the questions I think for young persons on this call is seeing where do we need to think about innovation? Where do we need to bring in our ideas? What areas should we be looking at? Um, and one of the questions we got is what makes a country a good transshipment point? And I know you said that we are being innovative in the region, Jamaica, Trinidad, um, the Bahamas, but is there another area? Are there any other areas that we should be developing or looking to develop in that would make us a better or the best transshipment point in the region? Or in the world? Uh, first off, the most important thing in the transshipment point is geography. You can't move geography. You're either where you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, Jamaica makes a very good transshipment point because it's on a north south route from the Panama Canal. Uh, Calcedo in the Dominican Republic 
makes a very good transshipment point because it's on the way from Europe to the Panama Canal in Central America. So geography is number one, the most important thing. But the others are a willing government, willing unions to adopt to the changes that need to be required. That's why the United States is not a transshipment point anymore because uh, the union infrastructure in the United States was adamantly and continues to be adamantly opposed to uh, certain transshipment things. Also, US Customs is not the most friendly environment to deal with when you're transshipping cargo. So that's another reason you need to have a very friendly arrangements for the movement of cargo through a facility, uh, not just the efficiency of the facility itself, uh, which gets to management, manpower, union relationships, as well as innovation of the people there. So geography is number one. Number two is a willing government. Number three is a willing workforce to adapt to the changes required. Uh, and last but by no means least is, you know, workforce participation willing to engage. And I think there's opportunity, for example, we've created uh, transshipment points in St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. Martin, Trinidad for Guyana, for example, Guyana and Suriname, Barbados also for uh, other parts, uh, other points, including also, um, you know, Guyana as well. So we've got opportunities for transshipment, uh, but largely it's geography. If you're not in the right place geographically, it's kind of tough, unless there's some huge advantage. Uh, you know, the only reason St. Martin, which is not in the right place at all, geography-wise, the only reason St. Martin works is because they have no customs. <laughs> Yeah. All right, period. The, the yeah. Customs doesn't exist on the, right. on the St. Martin side. So it's easy to bring cargo in and ship it out with minimal delays, uh, no entry process, because Customs doesn't exist on the Dutch side of St. Martin. Interesting. Um, and I, I want to go back to a point that we were talking about earlier. Um, Amazon, the development, the innovation, the fact that in three years, they're now taking over about 48% of their deliveries, whether it's shipment or otherwise. Um, and we know that even within that Amazon space, technology is taking over. You know, the, the innovation of, you know, technology and getting persons involved in that space has boomed. Um, and in your presentation, you mentioned uh, the, the improvement within shipping industries to autonomous ships. Now, what does that mean for persons who want to physically get involved in terms of going on the ships, in terms of being in and present in that space? Would the innovation and technology in that area um, in autonomous shipping take away or remove from the job opportunities for persons within that area, within that sector? Well, I think, you know, if you look at the future, uh, the future is full of opportunity. It doesn't mean it's in full of the opportunity of the past. It's always full of opportunity of new stuff. So if you just take shipping as an example, uh, running a ship, operating a ship, uh, as more autonomous vessels become commonplace, uh, the things that would happen on ship will happen on land. So you'll be running chief engineer, they may be on land. Now there'll always be probably some presence on the ship, um, you know, at least in my mind, I can envisage there'll be some presence uh, when ships are doing long distance voyages. But uh, bottom line is most of that work and activity can be done from the bridge on land. If you go to DP World's a gateway terminal in London, England, and you take a look at that facility, there isn't anybody on the pier at all. Nobody. Where are they? They're up in a big spacious air conditioned or warmed up office, all right? They've got their pet dog next to them uh, and they've got the computer screen and they're controlling the unloading of ships from all over the world, oh all right? And absolutely nobody's on the pier, but there's a whole bunch of people in the office. So they've taken their skill sets from the pier, being retrained into high tech. And those people can probably go work at Amazon or work at FedEx or work at any other technologically advanced company as opposed to just being a dock worker working a crane. Because everybody is trainable. 
I mean, I'm, Rick is a firm believer that everybody is trainable. Everybody can learn new skills. God knows I have to, all right? So, you know, there's, there's opportunity for everybody as long as, as I mentioned before, attitude will give you altitude. Altitude, yeah. Thank you. And I know that that's something that as young people, we hear all the time. Um, we just have time for about two more questions. Um, and in looking forward, looking to the future, we've had conversations before. We've seen global action in terms of climate change um, and that space. And in your presentation, you did a brilliant job of outlining that part of the innovation and part of what we're looking towards and what we actually have is looking at cleaner fuel and energy for the, for the shipment industry. Um, and then a broader question that we've got is, what impacts would climate change have on the future of the shipping industry within the Caribbean? We know we are disproportionately affected um, by the climate emergency. What impacts would that have for the shipping industry? I think the most important one obviously is getting clean fuel. So the IMO regs basically a couple of years ago, we had to convert the burning of dirty fuel, which is very, very dirty like tar uh, you have to heat it up and then, then it will get combustible. Uh, that very heavy fuel we don't burn anymore. So, and half of our ships forever have been diesel, clean diesel, marine diesel oil, and now clean diesel. So we're burning clean diesel in the ships. Uh, we've the two ships that we operate to Puerto Rico are burning clean LNG. It's a lot cleaner than uh, about 80% cleaner than the particulates that come out of clean diesel. So the Puerto Rico trade has got our advanced technology ships in that particular trade. Uh, the other innovations I think in terms for the Caribbean are um, uh, you know, what happens with battery power? Will battery power ever you know, transcend the need to have this kind of problem that we've got going on right now with uh, you know, with dirt burning oil-based products. I mean, I, I can see probably 20 years from now, the battery technology is moving so fast. I mean, you can now order a Tesla truck with a 500 mile range uh, for delivery in 2022. So, you know, you couldn't even conceive of that three years ago, that a truck would get 500 miles uh, on a battery charge. So there's huge opportunity there. I think for the Caribbean, there's great opportunity to pursue uh, cleaner power for your fuel stations. I mean, if you, can, if you can move to tidal power, ocean current power, wind power, geothermal power, I think that's a much bigger contribution uh, you know, for the economies of the Caribbean because the more that you can develop your own power source locally, whether it be wind, tidal, or current uh, or geothermal, all those dollars that you use to give the Arabs and others uh, in Saudi Arabia, Iraq and others to, and Venezuela to produce oil, you can keep those dollars now and build your own infrastructure. So, uh, and one of the biggest drains of foreign exchange is buying oil-based fuel for the Caribbean. So anything that could be done there, and obviously anything that we could do in helping that, encouraging that with what we learn, whether it be cleaner LNG or then moving on to wind, geothermal, um, and others, I think it's got a huge opportunity for the Caribbean uh, in terms of helping reduce um, you know, impacts on the climate. Okay, thank you. Um, and I mean, just for our final question, and it's going to be very short, young persons looking in, to get into this space, what would your advice be to us? We um, have bright ideas, we want to be involved, we want to be engaged, we're looking at this industry. What would be your advice to young persons want to, wanting to get into this space? Write a shipping company that you like, that you think has got, you know, innovation, drop them a note, explain who you are, what you would like to do, what you would like to learn, whether it could be a cruise line, it could be a container shipping company, it could be a tanker company. There is lots of opportunity there. There's opportunity on, uh, you know, large um, yachts, for example. So I would, you know, write a letter, old style or email, but don't be bashful and follow up with a phone call. 
phone still works. It's yep. good to hear. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank, thank you, Rick, very much for this conversation. It was very um, pleasant having this chat with you and answering the questions and, you know, kind of highlighting for me as a young person, for other persons on the call, how we can get involved, where the innovation is, and just how important this industry is to the development of the Caribbean region. Thank you. You're welcome. Wish you all success. Thank you so much, Prime Minister, <laughs> for your very uh, salient uh, questioning. And uh, thank you so much, Rick. This was really exciting. Um, I wanted to, before we ask Patricia Beckperson, the Deputy Program Manager, to uh, move a little to thanks, I wanted to personally uh, thank um, the Caribbean Youth Ambassadors here, so ably represented by Prime Minister of Youth, uh, Pierre Cook, also our partner, CANCA, the Caribbean Association of National Training Authorities, and of course, the Ministry, the Barbados Ministry of Maritime Affairs and the Economy. As you all know, uh, the most honorable Kirk Humphrey is our patron and opened the series. He will be closing the series and also um, identifying um, the uh, scholarship recipient. Thank you all very much. And I'll now ask please uh, Patricia McPherson, the Deputy Program Manager of Education and Caritam Secretariat to move the vote of thanks. Thank you very much, Geneve. I must first of all, um, say how thrilled I am to be part of this discussion. And uh, Lart and I were texting vigorously between ourselves with regard to one, the presentation, and more so the discussion that emanated from this. It gives me great pleasure then to say thank you. And we have been on a journey of the seas. And like any sea voyage, we have had our vessel. And our vessel has been an exotic liner. We were greeted at the beginning by Dr. Geneve Metzger-Brown. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about Geneve later on when I begin to talk about her mm -hmm. and the tremendous work that she'd been doing in, the, um, in this sector. Geneve, thank you for setting the tone and the atmosphere for today's conversation. And like any seaworthy vessel, the engine room is the hub of the activity. It is where all the wheels are turning and where all the movement occurs. Our engineers were not seen. They're not seen up front, but they are the real ones who make everything happen, who ensure that everything is fixed and ready for sale. To the chief engineer, I refer to Mr. Damon Clark. Damon is director of Notesmaster Caribbean and director of Notesmaster International Foundation. It was this chief engineer, Damon, who ensured that our links were up and running. It was Damon who tested and retested to provide an ease in the sailing. He was ably assisted by other engineers, namely Miss Vanessa Culey, Mrs. Vanessa Culey, Aaliyah Briggs, who is not here, but it was Aaliyah who worked on the flyer and designing that fly flyer. And today, the, the assistance of the Prime Minister of the Youth Parliament, Mr. Pierre K. Cook, Jr. I must say, Pierre, I let you know that Dr. Bristol and I, we were texting each other and we were commending of your excellence. We are saying the Caribbean has fine youth and you are a bright and distinguished young man. And we commend you for what you did here today. You brought quality to the conversation. Thank you. Like any other ship, they have captains, you know, but our ship, we had two captains. We had the first captain, Dr. Geneve Metzger-Brown. And you've noticed how, how Geneve easily slips in and out of roles. It was Geneve who scanned the horizon, looked at the waves and determined this journey. It was Geneve who determined that the region needed at this time 
to know more about the maritime industry. And through the work of her foundation, the American Caribbean Maritime Foundation, we've had this series of discussions going. Geneve, the Caribbean salutes you and thank and, 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 and thanks for your work and your contribution to the Caribbean community and to the youth of the Caribbean. I would like to say that we encourage our youth on this forum to apply for that scholarship. The foundation and Kanja have a scholarship that provides full tuition in the maritime studies. We hope that you take, a, take that on board. To the other captain, and you know who I'm talking about, Captain Dr. Laurent Bristol, a true trooper. It was Captain Bristol who navigated the seas, ensuring that there were no obstacles to, the, um, to, to stymie our work or our progress or that our, sink, our ship would sink. It was Laurent, Dr. Bristol, Captain Bristol, who recognized when we were not even having perhaps a, a medium for discussion who made that way. Many thanks for these ladies for navigating the seas with such skill and effort. A good journey always lifts the spirit and enlightens the mind. Rick, Mr. Rick Murrell, you did just that in your discussion of what is in the box. It was truly revealing. Thanks for your help in helping us to understand uh, what's in that box indeed. Thanks for helping us to, um, to recognize the importance of the Caribbean as uh, a, a revolutionary place in terms of this whole container industry. And more so, helping us as women and as girls to understand the tremendous impact that women and girls are making in the maritime se sector right here in the Caribbean. I must confess, I let you know that when we see those huge containers on the road, no longer are we gonna be irritated by the fact that they're competing with us for space, <laughs> but we will recognize the tremendous contribution they're bringing for us to right. daily exist, for us to live, for us to eat, and for us to have a good life. So we want to thank you. Finally, to you, our guest, your presence was critical for all of this to happen. We could have determined our journey. We could have prepared the ship, which we did, and we could have navigated the seas. But if you were not here, the exercise would have been futile. We thank you sincerely for being on this journey with us. And we hope that you have been edified and sufficiently educated and motivated to join into the maritime sector. I wish to say that the ship sails again in another two weeks, September 23rd. And we hope that you will return and this time ensure your friends come along to hear about the tremendous potential of the maritime sector. We are gonna be talking about the Phoenix rising, the cruise industry, its importance and impact for the Caribbean. And it will be done and will be done by no other and the very CEO of Royal Caribbean International, Michael Bailey. We look forward to your presence here. Ladies and gentlemen, the gangway has been lowered and you're about to disembark. But before you do, please ensure that you fill out the small questionnaire that we have provided in the chat. You know, we would like to serve you better. And finally, please take care of yourself. Remember always to wear your mask. Remain physically distant, but emotionally and socially connected. Lights out and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you at the next session. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Goodbye. Pierre. Bye. 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 No problems. Thank you. Excellent, Pierre. Excellent. <laughs>
Thanks so much, Rick, if you're still there. Yeah, Rick's here. Thank you. Thank you. A very exciting session this morning.